Who is Olavini? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm Olavini. Uh, I'm a Swedish developer. Uh, I've lived in Ecuador since uh, 2013 and I consider Ecuador my home. I've been a developer for close to 30 years. Uh, being a developer means that I write software programs with. And for the last 10 years or so, I have been focused primarily on developing software related to security and privacy. Uh, the kind of programs that I develop are, are things that I give away for free for everyone. Uh, so I want to protect the privacy and security of everyone on the planet, not just specific people that pay me. Um, so that's really who I am, or well, part of who I am, of course, my job and, and this is not, it doesn't define everything that I am, of course. Uh, since, uh, since April 2019, I've been uh, under investigation and then charged in a criminal procedure here in Ecuador, uh, and I'm still not free. Procedure. Okay, number two, can you explain the motives of the Ecuadorian for pressing charges against you? I actually have no idea. I really wish I could explain the motives. Uh, I have been spending nine months now trying to figure out why they're doing this. Me and my legal team and my friends, we have a lot of guesses about why they're doing this, but to be clear, they have never said their real motivation. When I was first arrested, I was arrested on the charges of uh, impacting the integrity of computer systems, but they never actually said which computer systems I had been uh, attacking in any way. Uh, they never actually asked me any questions. They never interviewed me. Uh, over the whole time when I was in prison, up until the end of the Finstrix from Fiscal, there has never been an official interview of me where they've asked any questions. And uh, of course, in, in media and in other places, both Maria Palaromo, the, the Minister of the Interior, well, previously Minister of Interior, now Minister of the Government, and the President of the Republic, uh, Ben Moreno, have both made a lot of pronouncements about saying that I've done several things, including I have worked together with uh, former uh, Foreign Minister, we had the Patinio to destabilize the government. Um, the President also said that I was actually caught in the airport in the process of hacking systems, that I've been hacking computer systems, telephone systems and many other things. They said that I was doing that when I was captured in the, uh, in the airport. Of course, the official statements from the police officers that captured me and also uh, the, you know, the videotapes from the airport show that I was actually reading a book. So all of these things are very, very weird. Um, the government has also made connections to Julian Assange. And of course, uh, when I was uh, taken at the airport, it was the same day as Julian Assange was actually thrown out of the Ecuadorian embassy and, and given to the British police. Uh, I'm only a friend of Julian Assange. Uh, I've never worked with him on anything or with WikiLeaks on anything, but they claim that I have worked together with him to do the same as others. However, none of these accusations have ever been presented with any evidence. Uh, it's something that the, the prosecutor of the case, he has been saying it in every hearing we've had, but he only refers to what Daniel Moreno has said in public statements. They've never provided any evidence for any of this. So, from my perspective, if I were to guess, uh, the fact that I'm friends with Julian, that I visited him in the embassy, might be one reason. Uh, another reason might be that I work on digital human rights. A lot of governments don't like people working on encryption, working on digital human rights. And you can see this around the world, that there's been harassment of, of lots of different people doing legitimate security investigation and work, uh, and actually facing criminal charges because of it. Nine months have passed since you were arrested in airport in Quito. In legal terms, what are you being accused of? Okay, so in legal terms, my current accusation is different from the one when I was arrested. When I was arrested, they didn't have an accusation and about 30 hours after my arrest, they finally charged me with uh, uh, of all the possible crimes, uh, number 232, which is this attack on the integrity of computer systems. But as I mentioned, they never actually specified which computer systems I attacked anyway. Two days before the end of the instruction fiscal, on the um, uh, 29th of August, they actually had a hearing where they changed the charges to another charge, uh, which has the number 234. 234 is the uh, um, unauthorized access to a computer system. Uh, and what they claim is that they have an image that shows that I broke into a computer system owned by the CNT in conjunction with Petro Ecuador and Salim. 
course, uh, the picture in question, first of all, the picture in question is just a picture of text, so it could say whatever, it doesn't actually prove anything. Uh, in fact, the uh, technical experts from the prosecution side have already made a conclusion that they can't actually make any informatic, uh, they can, can't extract any informatic data from it because it's not informatic evidence. However, the government is moving ahead with this, and they also have now an accusation from CMT based on this. They still, um, they still claim that this proves that I actually entered into CMT system, even though the image in question, if you assume that the image actually shows something that happened, it actually doesn't show me entering a username, it doesn't show me entering a password, it just shows like going to the first page and then doing nothing. So this is what they claim my crime is. And this is, of course, very, very different from what they arrested me for, which was like attacking the integrity of computer systems and impacting the integrity of the Ecuadorian government and working together with uh, many previous Ecuadorian officials in order to, I don't know, uh, sort of revolution or something like those lines. But they've said a many, lot of many things, but what they're now saying is very small. And interestingly enough, they claim, of course, from the beginning that I was working with Patino, they claim that I worked with Rafael Correa in order to do these things. But the accusation of intrusion is actually for October 2015 against the CNT, which, of course, was during Correa's time. And, uh, and uh, CNT, of course, is a public company. So if they needed anything from inside of CNT, they would presumably have easier ways of doing it than, than trying to get someone like me to break into it. Okay, number four. Recently, it was denounced that there were audio surveillance near your house. What irregularities have, have there been in your case? And what rights of yours have been violated? Wow. I'm sorry, but um, what rights of mine have been violated? That should be more or less all of them, uh, <laughs> repeatedly. Um, and, and in terms of all the violations, I have to admit, I don't remember all of them because we're talking, last time we counted, I think we were up in over 120 different specific violations of my rights, uh, violations of due process and so on and so on. Uh, when it comes to the audio surveillance, I, I suspect you refer to the image that my lawyer tweeted out last week uh, of a uh, two people sitting in a car outside of my uh, house uh, with a big antenna pointing out of it. We don't know if this is audio surveillance. We don't know what kind of surveillance this antenna was used for. There are several different possibilities, including surveillance of uh, phone traffic, surveillance of uh, Wi-Fi or other varieties. So we don't know if it was audio surveillance or something completely different. Um, we do know that they keep following us. Uh, both me and my lawyers and my friends have been repeatedly followed. Um, most days there is cars parked outside of my building following me when I leave when I go to work, when I go somewhere else. Uh, sometimes the surveillance is more heavy, sometimes they're not there, but uh, in general, since I came out of prison over six months ago, they are still, um, they are still following me almost everywhere I go. Um, as far as we know, they don't have any legal right to do that. In terms of other violations, of course, my violations started on the same day when I was arrested. I was, uh, I was arrested at the airport uh, between 3 and 3.15 in the afternoon. And um, at that point, as we found out later, the actual orders to detain me uh, uh, were, were happening less than an hour before. But we also have evidence that I was followed at the airport even before then. Um, I was detained uh, without a translator, without getting access to a lawyer, um, without at any point being t told why I was detained. Uh, I was taken away from the airport and then back to the airport during the eight hour window of the first detention, which is, so, so this kind of, I don't remember the name of it, but this first eight hour detention is not actually supposed to be, to be a detention. Uh, it's like a holding order. But a holding order uh, has to be two different things as far as I understand. The first one is it has to be in the same place. So you can't take me away from there and then take me back. Then, then the holding order is over. So by taking me out of the airport and then back again, they actually broke the holding order. Secondly, the holding order is just supposed to hold someone at the place where a crime was committed. And of course, the airport was not where they claimed that any of the crimes were committed. So uh, for these and many other reasons, uh, this holding order was not actually a holding order, but it was actually a legal, an illegal detention. Uh, when I was finally officially detained uh, on an order from a judge at uh, between 11 and 11.10 in the evening, I still did not have 
a lawyer. I still did not have a translator. They claim that they read me my rights, but actually uh, I didn't understand Spanish enough and they tried to read it in English. Their English was so bad that I couldn't understand what they were saying. They denied me calls to family, they denied me calls to lawyer, and they never notified the Swedish embassy of my uh, arrest, which is something that you have to do according to the constitution. They then held me uh, outside of proper detention facilities until around 8 a.m. in the morning the day after when they took me to Florence. Uh, so that was just like, that was just what happened on the 11th. Uh, and during the process going on from there, there have been so many violations of my rights uh, and that I, yeah, we could spend all day just in your uh, We have a nice infographic that details some of them uh, that, that tell you like a little bit of the different things that happen. The latest one, or the biggest one that have been happening over the last few months, is that uh, my pre-trial was supposed. To, it was first scheduled for October 10. Of course, this is also legal because the instruction fiscal ended on 31st of August, uh, and the pre-trial, according to the to the administrative rules of Ecuador, a pre-trial can only happen maximum 15 days after the end of the instruction fiscal. But the 10th of October, this was actually uh, cancelled that hearing because of the pattern nacional. And up until Friday, we have not had a date for a pretrial. So we have basically just gone for three months, just waiting for them to decide to go to a pretrial. And during this time, there have been several judges assigned to the case, and they've spent basically all of their time fighting with each other about who, who can get out of the case, because no judge is interested in having the case. So we've been without judge for most of the case, or for most of the last few months, which is also something that is not proper. And in fact, the provincial court uh, in the end of December uh, finally made a decision about who the proper judge should have been. And they also sent a uh, kind of a warning to the Consejo de Comunitura saying that this kind of behavior that this judge was not proper and she should be uh, censored or investigated for it. Okay, number five. Why is the struggle for digital rights and free software important? So, digital rights. <sighs> Basically, so, sometimes I feel like this whole idea of digital rights is kind of absurd because uh, your human rights should be the same no matter whether they are in the, in the, like in the, in the analog, uh, I would say real world, but of course uh, we live a lot of our lives in the, in the digital world, so it's as much real as the, as the other world. But our human rights should be the same in both of these places. But the fact is that they are not. The fact is that right now, uh, because digital media, because digital technology makes it so easy to invade privacy and to, to abuse people's uh, rights in so many different ways, a lot of these kind of abuses happen. Uh, the right to security and privacy are much better protected in the, in the analog world. But because surveillance is so simple to do in the digital world, it's something that happens naturally and a lot of governments claim that the digital place is different. From my perspective, it shouldn't be different. And, and from my perspective, technology should protect us. We should have the same rights everywhere. I, I don't feel like that's a very radical statement, but a lot of people seem to think that that's a crazy thing to say. Um, so free software is very important because um, without free software, we have no way of doing what the, what, what the computers are doing. We don't know what the technology is doing. We can't trust that they're doing the right thing. And we know that there are backdoors, we know that there are bugs, we know that there are errors uh, that are in the systems we use. Free software doesn't always fix all those problems, but it makes it possible for us to fix them. It gives us the possibility of, gives us the chance of fighting back against these kind of attacks on digital rights. For me, privacy is one of those rights that uh, by itself, privacy might not seem like it's super important. But at the end of the day, uh, privacy is something that we we need in order to uh, have all the other things that a society depends on. Say, for example, elections. Democracy as a concept is based on the idea that people are free to choose who they want to govern them. Uh, and without free elections, then, then the whole idea of democracy kind of goes out the window. But the problem is, if you don't have privacy, if you don't, if you know that you are going to be surveilled, you don't really have freedom because you know that your choices will be observed. And if the government are the ones that are surveilling you, well, 
you're probably not going to be doing the same kind of choices as you would make if the government was not surveilling you. So privacy for me is one of those core principles that is necessary for democracy to function. And there's been studies, uh, Facebook did some, and there's been some other studies that show that when people are being surveilled, their political choices change. They become more conservative. They, they don't uh, they don't consider alternatives that they would have considered otherwise. So we know from a lot of research that sociologically, privacy is necessary for democracy. Okay. Why do you think that the preliminary hearing of the trial will happen in February? <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm skeptical that it will happen in February because considering what has happened up until now with multiple delays, with multiple cases where the judges disappear, uh, where things get canceled for no reason, I would not be surprised if they change the pretrial date again. It is my feeling that the government is afraid of moving forward in this process because they know that they have no chance of winning unless they uh, unless they proceed with completely illegal means. And they also know that if they proceed illegally, this case has so much international attention that sooner or later, if they do this illegally, this is going to come back to them. Maybe they will win in the lower courts by, by pressuring the judges to do the wrong thing, but sooner or later, we're going to get to the higher instances. We will get to the Supreme Court, and if that doesn't work, we will get to the international courts. And sooner or later, we will prove that this case has been, first of all, without any basis, and second, has violated every fundamental right of me and, and of people in Ecuador. Because don't, don't forget, if this kind of thing, if they can do this to me, they are going to start doing it towards Ecuadorian, and they are already doing it towards Ecuadorian, in fact. Uh, so the question of why they finally schedule it, I do think that maybe they also feel that there is this balance, right? Like they probably don't want to ever do it, but they also know that they can't drag it out forever. They can't come up with excuses all the time. So if it actually happens in February, it's because they realize that they have to, they have to bite the sour apple and move forward at some point. Okay. Final question. From the beginning, Lenin Moreno and Maria Parla Romo have insisted in making accusations against you in the media. Were said accusations ever formally presented in the legal process? So I touched on this a little bit before. It's not just that they have made accusations. They have made accusations that have been disproven in the evidence for the case. So for example, uh, Lenin Moreno gave his official uh, witness or his official testimony where he simply said that he doesn't know anything about my case except for what Maria Palaromo has said publicly. But Maria Palaromo never said publicly that I was hacking in the airport. She never said that I didn't have any training equipment with me. So even here, we can see that the president is actually contradicting himself. Maria Palaromo has said the same thing. In her t testimony, she actually claims that they didn't have evidence that I had committed any crime. They only were worried that I might commit a crime. Uh, this is, of course, different from what she said publicly, where she has claimed not only that I've committed several crimes, she's also claimed that they have all the evidence needed to convict me of those crimes. She has said this repeatedly, and Benny Moreno has said this repeatedly. None of that evidence has ever, ever shown up. If you look in the expediente, there is no such thing in there. Uh, in fact, the only evidence that they are really using, the, the core evidence they're using to accuse me of a crime, is this image that I talked about. All the other stuff is ancillary reports from the CNT and from, from technical experts and so on. That's what they're going to trial with. So all this talk about having evidence that I've committed a crime is clearly something that was completely made up from the beginning. The only thing that is in the expediente is actually Elena Moreno's public statements because the prosecutor seems to believe that those public statements are equivalent to proof. Uh, so those are in the expediente and sometimes, or quite a lot of time during the hearings, um, the prosecutor spends a lot of time during the hearings actually talking about what Lili Moreno has said. Uh, but no, no evidence at all. <laughs>